Great. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to all the members of the panel. I was joking earlier that we run the risk of outnumbering the audience. But uh, um, I also want to thank, on behalf of myself and my team members on, the, on this consultancy, Bill Gray and Georgia Saruti, all those staff members in the five INGOs and their partner organisations who gave up a lot of valuable time working in extremely difficult and challenging circumstances to talk to us about their experiences and their ideas and to share, share their thoughts on how we might improve this really important area of work. So my presentation is going to be in three <coughs> broad parts. Part one, I'm going to talk about the context of this study, um, set out some broad background for so some of which will be known to all of you, but um, just to see, make sure we're all on the right page, the same page as we set off, as it were. Uh, part two, where I talk about the approach to the research and our key findings. And then finally, I'll conclude with our, um, some broad sweep uh, conclusions and the recommendations from the study itself before handing back to the panel. So I think we all know, um, don't we, that that essentially this Tsunami Evaluation Coalition made a very bold call for reorienting the humanitarian system back in 2006. Um, it, it this, to date, this was uh, still the largest ever evaluation of humanitarian aid undertaken. And the number one recommendation was for a fundamental reorientation from supplying aid to facilitating communities' own relief and development priorities. And a, and a key element of that was, the, uh, was to put local and national actors at the heart of humanitarian responses. Now, there's been a great deal of debate uh, and a lot of rhetoric about this issue since that time uh, on the issue of southern capacity, <laughs> on the development of north-south partnerships. Um, and the reason why I guess our team would argue that it still re largely remains rhetoric is that despite a number of calls such as this, there are very few elements of the formal humanitarian system, either in policy or practice, that really reflect the need for this, this transformation. When, when people talk about partnerships in the sector, it's still largely uh, about, uh, referring to relationships between members of the international community, between donors and the UN, between the UN and NGOs. And the local versions come a very poor kind of last place. And this is despite the fact that we've had um, a repeated evidence and quite stark evidence that these issues persist in the sector. So this was the, one of the key recommendations or findings of the ECB joint evaluation, which said essentially INGAs are not making use of local partnerships. Um, that although local partnerships were critical to understanding context, to shaping and informing responses, to encouraging local acceptance <laughs> of assistance, these relationships are not in place and there's a serious <coughs> lack of connectedness to context. Um, many of you will know the Ashdown Review and I'm really pleased we've got Dylan on the panel here uh, because I know he's <laughs> taken the responsibility for implementing it across many parts of DFID and the sector as a whole. And the Ashdown Review um, has had quite an influence on the sector and um, actually identified, flagged this very issue um, and identified it as being uh, specific to DFID, but not just DFID. The funding of national local NGOs remains largely hit and miss. It's not a conscious strategy. It's a byproduct of the way the system works. And I think that's a really important point. It's a byproduct. And why is it, given we've been talking about this issue for so long, that it's still a byproduct? Um, I think because of the lack of funding, because of the nature of the political and institutional changes that are needed to deliver against that first tsunami evaluation recommendation. We're becoming increasingly aware that this isn't a simple problem with a technical fix. It's a systemic issue that goes right to the heart of some of the operational and policy challenges we face. Um, and the commonly held view amongst those that we spoke to is that partnerships haven't really taken forward because they challenge the status quo of the sector in terms of resource distribution, in terms of power, and in terms of control. And the kinds of changes called for in the tech, in the tsunami evaluation, really contrast with many of the successful change efforts in the sector, which by comparison have been relatively incremental, tinkering at the margins of the sector, not really fundamentally changing the business model. And this kind of change really does challenge our business model and our way of thinking. So this really is the context for our research. Um, 
we followed on the back of a number of find uh, number of research studies by Christian Aid and Oxfam, and I think the previous Christian Aid one's actually here. Um, and what we were specifically trying to do, and I think we were, I'm right in saying it was one of the first studies to try and do this, to try and get a better understanding of this systemic issue by looking across organisations, uh, taking a deliberately comparative approach, looking at organisations that actually had very different mandates, philosophies, values, and operating models. So that, that's actually quite an important point. So we wanted to look at the practical experience of partnerships in four different emergency settings. Um, Haiti, Kenya, the Pakistan floods, and uh, Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We chose these uh, because we knew they were the most challenging responses that the humanitarian sector had worked on in the last few years. And it's in these big, large-scale responses that partnerships are most difficult to <coughs> enact. And so we kind of wanted to learn from the cold face of partnerships. It's all very well saying we can do partnerships well in small to medium-sized emergencies. There's lots of lessons there, but this is where the sector really does need to change, where it's a challenge, but also, in the old Chinese say, there's also great opportunity for improvement. Um, that same rationale led us to think about, focus on response efforts rather than recovery or resilience, partly because of the uh, limitations we faced in the study. But we did look at those area, other areas in terms of how response impacted, say, on recovery, and also how resilience supported response. Um, we, we used OECD DAC criteria for thinking about this, partly, again, because we, we studied carefully a lot of the reports that had been produced in the past in partnerships. And we felt like there was a little bit of a gap in terms of actually linking partnerships very clearly to issues of humanitarian performance. The, 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 a lot of the partnership reviews ended up with kind of apple pie style statements of isn't it a really good thing but we wanted to look very long and hard and say well what are the costs and the benefits of partnerships Wh where can it be of value let's not try and act as if it's a silver bullet to the problems of the sector and um, as we progressed in the research we actually realized uh, that we had a tremendous resource in terms of the alnet state of the humanitarian system report providing us with a benchmark for, for our analyses, and that's what we try to do through our, our, our kind of research process. So essentially our core f findings are a summary of a um, number of different areas across uh, partnerships, uh, across those agencies. And then we set out our overarching assessment of the contribution of partnerships in that area of performance against the ALNAP uh, as assessment. So let me move on now to the findings. I'm slightly, uh, my slides seem to have changed slightly, but never mind. Um, so the first point is around relevance and appropriateness. And for those of you that don't know, this is really asking the question, how well tailored are humanitarian activities to local needs? Um, what we found that essentially while conve conventional aid delivery is often criticised for its lack of relevance and appropriateness, well-designed partnerships can in fact really concretely help address these issues. And they do this by, because of their very nature, by the fact that they are with organisations that are embedded and work over long terms with communities, that they're, they're staffed by people who have, have cultural understanding, um, they are responsive to needs, especially as they change over time. And uh, in the best cases, these partnership-based responses are very much geared around the community's own understanding because it is not so much of a cost to these local organisations to establish what that understanding is compared to an international response. Um, across the four emergencies, this was the area that um, the people we spoke to most strongly ident identified as the kind of, this is the big, big win for partnerships. This is where it most adds value. Um, and this is also the area where there's the fewest ambiguities in terms of our findings. There's an obvious one, which is, to ensure that the partner organisations themselves do have <coughs> a commitment to humanitarian principles, but the kinds of screening mechanisms that we observed were actually pretty, pretty good in enabling that. So um, for our summaries, what, what we did was used a fairly simple five-part classification, strong, good, moderate, poor, weak. And the potential or the contribution of partnerships across those 20 ca uh, case studies was very strong in this area. By contrast, the ALNAP Humanitarian System Report identified that overall sector performance in this area is moderate. Um, although the sector has seen modest improvements in this area, there's a persistent weakness in consultation of affected populations. 
Let me move on to effectiveness. And this is really how well an activity has achieved its purpose and how well it can be expected to do so on the basis of the output. And here what, what's really interesting is partner-based responses can be fast and responsive and well prepared for action. There was a Haiti example where a number of partner-based responses actually um, were put in place two or three weeks before international agencies mobilised. Um, similarly in Pakistan, so particularly for sudden onset crises, there's a, there's a re real benefit <coughs> that partner-based responses have. And there are a number of areas where working closely with partners enabled international actors to develop systems that are <coughs> much more accountable uh, and, as I mentioned earlier, much more geared around community engagement. Um, but it's not a a kind of unalloyed good here. There are, there are issues of coordination and learning and human resources that are just as much a problem for partners as they are for the wider system, <laughs> I guess because of the, the, the context in which we're working. So here the, the contribution of partnerships is good. Uh, and again, the system performance was, was moderate. Objectives are largely being met by the system in rega regards to effectiveness. But there are serious issues around leadership and timeliness. Um, and every major... A uh, review of emergencies undertaken in the last two years, between 2009 and 2011, when the state of the system reported, found a very mixed review in terms of effectiveness. Um, let me move on to efficiency. And this is, a, this is a really important area for the sector, particularly in the UK at the moment, because of the focus on value for money and, uh, and the, I guess, a, a need to try and make things from one perspective as, as cost effective as possible and from another perspective as cheap as possible. And so this is, a, this is a really interesting area because a lot of people point to partnerships and say they can be much cheaper and that's the reason why we should be doing it. But actually what we found is efficiency shouldn't be reduced to a very simplistic assessment of how cheap things are. But it should be based on the relative strengths and weaknesses. What do you get for your money? Uh, and in particular, what does it cost to do things in different settings? Um, and cost effectiveness when it comes to partnerships can be a very blunt instrument. Um, what we actually found was there are cost savings around partnerships which can be considerable, especially in terms of staff costs and all the other things that are required to put people on boots on the ground, as it were. But there are other aspects of a humanitarian response, uh, for example, around coordination, around materials, around logistics, which are pretty much at parity with international efforts. But what often doesn't get talked about are the costs of doing partnerships. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a significant issue for all of the organisations involved. Um, for those organisations that commit to partnerships as part of their overall mandate, they, they take on board those costs and they see them as just part of the way of doing business. But um, there, are, there are costs in terms of setting up, in terms of maintaining, in terms of providing ongoing capacity support. And what was really interesting is a lot of the organisations that are doing this are, are funding those costs out of their own core costs. They don't get, generally get support from it through emergency efforts. So the, these costs are, are there, they're very apparent, but they're not really being dealt with in a strategic way by, by the sector. So I would say in terms of efficiency, I think there may be less scope for partnerships to enhance efficiency in the short term because they're not a silver bullet to make, th make humanitarianism cheaper. They require time and money to be invested for them to be more strategic and more intelligent. Um, in terms of the overall system-wide performance, we saw the performance as being moderate. This is because, essentially, uh, there is a lot of interest in value for money, there's a lot of interest in cost-based analyses, but we haven't really seen that being operationalised in the sector yet, in terms of how people think about and do decision-making on the ground. The fourth area was coverage. And this is um, the, the extent to which assistance reaches all of those groups th that need aid when they need it. And this is seen by the partnership focused agencies as a major limiting factor. Um, and this didn't matter whether you were a, a, a partnership focused organisation or a direct delivery organisation. Um, they, they essentially said coverage is the main issue. We can scale up to it, we can fund up to a certain uh, amount, but beyond that it becomes very difficult. We have to find multiple partners. They may not often be... Um, present. But actually the partners themselves suggested that this was a bit of a red herring um, and a lot of the local and national organisations we spoke to said first of all it's not really about delivering efficient programmes at scale, um, it's often about spending at scale um, and can we spend at scale and quickly. And that's quite interesting because it kind of goes back to the point of the, the ALNET finding that actually coverage isn't something that's really being addressed significantly well across the sector. Um, and 
the other point as well is that across the board, many of these partnerships that we see in response are being established with relatively small organisations that are localised and have thematic focus areas. And so uh, whilst uh, there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where if partnerships are being established with small organisations, well, of course, they're not going to necessarily deliver coverage. So, w w And what was interesting was there was a notable lack of the big national NGOs like BRAC or um, government ancillaries, or even the private sector being talked about in the context of these kinds of partnerships. Um, and those are areas where it was felt that actually there is real potential for scale and coverage to be reached through these efforts. So in terms of the potential of partnerships in this area, we would say MODRA. Um, it is the most challenging area for partnerships as they're currently delivered by the organ system. And you can't address issues of scale simply by pumping more money into, into organisations. Um, as all of the participating organisations have learned over time, often to their cost. Um, I, I would say that in terms of the overall system performance, Alnant was actually quite damning on this and said the coverage is poor. Um, there's a largely a consequence of uh, human financial and material resources simply not growing fast enough to keep, keep pace with rising needs. So that, that's a global picture of coverage. The, the final point I want to make around performance is connectedness, and this is the extent to which short-term emergency response takes into account longer-term pre-existing issues. And the key points here are um, pretty straightforward, that national partners clearly can help to smooth the links between resilience, preparedness, response and recovery and development. And, and there are lots of examples of this happening across the, across the board. But they cannot do this unless funding NGOs and donors put their own house in order. Otherwise, what you get is these kind of institutional biases and divides essentially getting transferred down the system and, and partner organisations working in very siloed ways, even though their instincts are not to do that because that's the way that the funding is moving towards them. Now, we noted the potentially the resilience agenda to actually address <coughs> this issue. Um, but I guess we, we had concerns that resilience is in itself being, being slightly siloed at the moment. And we're seeing the development taking a side taking on their board on board their own understanding of resilience with the humanitarian with their own understanding of resilience and not enough of it being an integrating kind of idea and integrating practice. So based on our assessments of <coughs> partnerships across the board, this is another area like relevance and appropriateness where partnerships really come into their own. The contribution of partnerships across the board was good. Um, however, it's really important, as I said, that we need to change the way that we support partners if they're really going to be able to capitalise on the on the uh, on these opportunities, and don't and so that we don't end up passing on our own own internal divisions. Um, and Alnap found that this area was moderate. There have been some improvements in how humanitarian res responses link to longer term objectives, but these have largely come about because of host country governments and institutions in those contexts doing it despite the international system rather than because of it. So these are the kind of five areas of findings. And what we've done uh, in the report is we provided a very illustrative kind of indication. Um, here, th this kind of spider <coughs> diagram, which is the kind of thing you see much more commonly in PwC or Deloitte and Touche presentations. We prepared one of these just to show you essentially the, um, the outer line is um, strong and the kind of inner uh, hex uh, pentagon is, is weak. The blue line is where the system currently is, uh, based on our benchmarking of the ALNAP report. And I should say, actually, this is our own independent assessment. The process was endorsed by ALNAP, but they didn't necessarily say agree with our findings. Or, but um, it's something I think we, we found the ALNAP report very useful for. The red line shows the potential of partnerships. And I guess what we're trying to do here, just to illustrate very, very simply that there, there are three areas where the partnership approach is strongest, where it has the most potential to contribute to enhanced humanitarian performance. And that's around relevance and appropriateness, effectiveness and connectedness. And it's those areas in the 20 contexts that we looked at in this research, the five <laughs> organisations in four settings, that partnerships are making the most consistent and un unambiguous contribution. And in the other two areas, the picture is rather more nuanced. It involved both potential benefits but also considerable challenges. Um, let me move on to conclusions. I guess what we, what we also did, as, um, as you and those will have read the report will know, is that we did some assessment of, of the potential of this area by developing a kind of SWOT analysis. What are the strengths, weaknesses, 
opportunities and threats and really tried to um, make that as empirical as possible by speaking to people at the senior level within organizations to complement the interviews we did um, at the operational level. Um, and what was very clear was that there are, there are a number of factors beyond the sector, beyond partnerships themselves, that are pushing for greater localization of humanitarian aid. <coughs> and the biggest one of these is, is the rise in the number of emergencies. And it's closely followed by what the increase in self-sufficient states, or from the humanitarian sector's perspective, belligerent states. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, there's a real um, issue here around the opportunity for localization. But despite this evidence, um, it's not clear that the rhetoric's really moved on. Funding and structures still largely give preference to international actors over national ones. Um, we're seeing growing amounts of evidence from ev evaluations. This is just another piece in that uh, path of evidence, if you like. Uh, but I think what, we, what we've identified is actually, despite this evidence, despite the scope for a renewed focus on capacity and partnerships, there's a, there's a lot of issues which are to do with political will, ultimately. Do we have the will to make the sector better? Um, what we concluded was that actually we need a step change in the sector's efforts in southern capacities and partnerships. If we're going <coughs> to, and we'd, we're not doing this not just because it's the right thing to do, not just because it's the trend of the future, because it's a means of addressing long standing issues in humanitarian performance. And uh, a number of recommendation areas, we feel there's a need to invest in change, to invest in local and national partnerships as a priority for donors, finding mechanisms to doing so within existing response fund mechanisms. That we need, um, although people have been talking about partnerships for a long time, it's still a byproduct of the way the humanitarian sector is financed. And we don't see any reason why this has to be the case. The development sector has established funds to actually f uh, support capacity building uh, in development areas, uh, the African Capacity Building Fund being the most prominent one. And that's something that something like 20 donors actually support that. We need something like that in our sector, and we need it really urgently. There's no reason why we can't set it up. And transaction costs and all these issues around you know, uh, coverage and uh, giving people small amounts of money, a fund which is based in the, in the south, which is governed by both north and northern and southern actors, I think the time really is ripe for this. Um, around setting the agenda, I think we need to try and make this, this issue central to the humanitarian policy agendas, especially as we build up to the World Humanitarian Summit that's in 2016, because performance and effectiveness are really key parts of that agenda. So I think that the partnerships and uh, capacity need to take their uh, rightful place uh, amongst those debates and not merely be sidelined. And the partnership role in resilience also needs to be acknowledged and integrated. Um, we need to build knowledge and shared understanding. This has been a first step in terms of looking across organisations. We need to do much more of this. We need to have some kind of platform or mechanism to uh, further our understanding at that level. And then finally around practices. We think that there needs to be as much focus on capacity assessments as there are on needs assessments if we're going to have a more balanced humanitarian sector. And we need partnership efforts to move towards away from uh, these kind of bilateral relationships towards a more networked effort. I guess the final point uh, we want to make, um, and I, this is very much kind of the myself and my authors, that, that at the present time, they, these partnerships don't achieve their full potential, just to reiterate. And this is an opportunity that we are continuing to miss, and we're going to continue to miss. Um, but even if the humanitarian sector was to retain the shape and form that it has today, there's, there's some benefits of partnerships. But actually, there's a transformative vision that we all seem to kind of share to some extent of a different kind of sector where partnerships are more part of the day-to-day -day of the way that we do humanitarian aid. And it's a more democratic and a more balanced and more accountable endeavour. And <coughs> we think this is possible. It's just whether or not we've got the political will. <coughs>